half a year ago, I made something that could kill you if you breathed it in. Now, before you call the cops on me, let me just say, I've always been a STEM kid. And while that's all fine and dandy, there's just one catch. I come from Thailand, which is not really known for its scientific development or for being developed in the first place. So my only exposure to nanotechnology was through the media, through local and international sources. Here's what they told me. Nanotech is completely safe and should be trusted without question. Nanotech is all about nanobots and other sci-fi stuff that no one understands. They couldn't have been more wrong even if they had tried. Last summer, I had the greatest opportunity of my life. Every STEM kid's dream, to intern in a lab and tinker with expensive toys. I landed an internship at the National Nanotechnology Center in Thailand, which was 40 minutes away from my house. I got so excited because I thought we'd be making nanobots and injecting them into people because that's all I'd ever known. So, it was then that I saw. I arrived at the lab. I felt scammed. There were no nanobots around. Because the lab I worked at researches microneedles, and that was it. Or so I thought. That was when I realized three key things about nanotech. One, the needles that I had worked with and called trash at the beginning had the ability to treat diabetes, inject vaccines, and regulate your hormones all without drawing blood. The needles were not long enough to pierce your blood vessels or touch your nerve endings. In other words, they were painless and you didn't bleed. That was insanity in my mind. But it made me aware of the amount of medical progress the public is not exposed to. Two, nanotechnology is a lot more about manipulating materials at the molecular level than building nanobots, and for good reason. And third, the depiction of nanotech in our society is so wrong. Most people have no idea what it is, and the little they do know about it is inaccurate. So, three things. Material manipulation, painless medical treatment, and a horrendously misinformed public. I want to talk more about this third one, because I believe that reliable information, especially on emerging sciences, is necessary to form a robust public opinion. So when I was in the lab, I experimented with making nanorods out of zinc oxide to increase the surface area between the needles and the skin. The way it works is that the zinc oxide starts out as this vapor, which then crystallizes onto the surface of the microneedles, and they form this hair-like structure. If you've ever been in a cave and you see those big quartz crystals, you'll see that they sort of grow out from the same base. Same with the nanorods, but at the nanoscale. But when the head of the lab gave me a sample to take to the biotech division to test for toxins, I got confused. What? Zinc oxide. The FDA says it's a food additive, so it must be safe, right? Well, not quite. Only at our scale. It turns out that when you manipulate the structure of these substances, it can cause unintentional, maybe even harmful effects on the human body. Substances that start out fine can turn carcinogenic, meaning that they cause cancer, or they can kill tissue directly. People have already died from this. In 2009, two women in China inhaled nanoparticles while working in a factory with paint. The nanoparticles invaded their lungs, caused a buildup of fluid and lung failure. I was lucky to have worn a respirator because it turns out that a 2011 study showed that zinc oxide nanoparticles cause lung inflammation and system-wide toxicity. That sort of opened my mind to the darker aspects of nanomedicine. In the scientific community, there's been a lot of discussion around nanomaterials that the public doesn't know about. The FDA warned about assessing potentially dangerous aspects of nanomaterials that come from its structure. But according to John Besley, an expert in scientific communication at Michigan State, the majority of people with opinions about nanotech believe that the benefits outweigh the risks, despite knowing so little about it. Part of it is the media's fault. In America, we really love to distrust the media. 
fake news, alternative facts, the mainstream media can't be trusted. We've all heard this before. It's only natural for the media to want to grab as much attention as they can. They want better, better ratings, more likes, and more reposts from consumers like us. The media has turned nanotech into a buzzword. It's become synonymous with medical robots that swim through your bloodstream that, to be honest, don't even exist. Nanobots, in the sense of nano-sized robotics, aren't even close to becoming a thing, probably in the foreseeable future. So why do we keep hearing about this tech that's not even here, but we're left in the dark about the tech that's already in the palm of our hands? The reason is money. With the information age shortening the human attention span to about eight seconds, according to a study by Microsoft in 2018, it has become more crucial than ever for the media to grab your attention in the most efficient way possible. And that means repeating the same vivid imagery over and over and over. The problem starts when the media starts to overemphasize these seemingly positive attributes of nanotech while ignoring the many concerns that we have with the field. There's so much that we don't know about nanotech and its potential dangers that we can get easily hooked on the media's fantasy nanobot world because it sounds exciting, it's interesting, it gets the views, but it just isn't real. In a study published in the Nanotechnology Reviews in 2018, a machine learning algorithm conducted a sentiment analysis of 6,298 tweets. Now, the analysis, which analyzes words commonly used regarding nanotech, found that there was an overwhelming frequency of positive emotions such as trust, joy, and anticipation when compared to more negative tones like fear and anger. And the subsequent polarity analysis, which separates these into positive and negative strictly, found that the positive tweets outnumbered the negative tweets by 400%. So what needs to happen? is for scientists and the media to work more closely together to create a more reasonable and rational view of their science that fits in with social factors. Professors at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Northeastern University recommend that scientific communication be driven by an understanding of the general public's worldview because it fits in with social factors and it considers existing biases. Now, the moral of the story here is that we as a public must not, get ahead, must not get ahead of ourselves when it comes to assessing emerging sciences. It is the duty of both scientists and the media to do a better job at presenting their scientific innovations in a way that reveals the whole truth, not just the flashy bits, because they hold tremendous influence over public opinion. I admit it, in America, Pharmaceutical companies have tremendous sway over the, over the development of new technologies. But in the end, it is public opinion that drives lawmakers and regulators when it comes to these technologies. Therefore, we need to have this general awareness of the potential benefits and the drawbacks of such a science. But there is one more thing. When I went home at the end of my internship, when I was in the car, I finally understood something about what Einstein meant when he said that information is not knowledge. The lab team, whether they knew it or not, taught me something about what it meant to truly know something. And it's that about knowledge, not everyone can give you the right sources. Not everyone will understand it for you. But with the right combination of information and awareness, the public can make those better solutions. They can come to those better judgments and they can make those better decisions when it comes to science and the world. Thank you, take care.